Welcome to NCC Live. We are so excited to celebrate the great name of Jesus with you today. Can you do me a favor and right there at your home, stand to your feet, put your hands together for Jesus, because if you're carrying some guilt, some shame, whatever it is, we're going to put that aside today and walk into the freedom that comes from him. Because I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind? Away. It was my tomb till I met you. Come on. I was breathing, cause I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures, all my failures, I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I made. But then you called my name. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name. Now your mercy has saved my soul And now your freedom is all that I know We're going to celebrate who Jesus is, what he's done in our life, and we can have a home in him. Come on, let's sing this. And I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love. Welcome to NCC. We are so grateful to be with you today. Even though we might be worshiping all across the world, I truly believe that when we lift up God in praise, He is bringing us together. We are so excited to be starting a brand new series today called Can We Talk? Separation of Church and Hate. 
But before we get to hear more about that from Pastor David, we would love to get to know you and connect with you. You can fill out a connect card and you can do that from our website, mynw.cc. You can also jump on the chat, talk to any one of our online hosts. They would love to help you out and get to know you. And of course, if there's something we can be praying for, please don't hesitate to let us know how we can be lifting you up and encouraging you in this time of life right now. Later in the service, we will have a time of communion and a time of generosity. And if you would like to financially help us continue to meet the needs of the community and connect people to Jesus, simply go to our website, click on the link that says give. And once again, we want nothing more than to help those that need help. And I believe that the generosity of the church is really a great way to make that possible. So I just want to say thank you. Keep making a difference. All right, as we sing this next song, if you're going through any kind of challenge or struggle, I would just encourage you to sing this song with us, knowing that God is going to bring you peace through the storm. Let's sing this out together. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name still. Call the sea to still, the raging me to still, every wave at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Breathe, call these bones to live, call these lungs to sing once again, I will pray. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, 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 you make the darkness tremble.
you for that truth, that you silence fear, that you are light in the darkness. And this next song we're about to sing comes from the Gospel of Luke, that God loves us so much that he pursues the one, leaving the 99. And I don't know what you're carrying today, but just know that whatever you're facing, it's not bigger than God, and it will never separate, separate you from him. Let's sing. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathe your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And so Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Yeah, yeah You're never-ending, never-failing Thank you, Father Come on, church, let's sing this together. When I was your foe. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, when I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. So, so kind to me. Come on, church, let's proclaim this. and declare this next part. I don't know what it is that you're facing today. Maybe you're just feeling like there's something you've done that separates you from God, but you gotta know that there is nothing in this world that's gonna separate you from him, that God's gonna pursue you. He's gonna knock down those barriers, knock down those walls. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Come on, let's sing that together. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Come on, church, let's proclaim that. There's no shadow you won't light up. After me, there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me, there's no shadow, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me, there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me.
bow, bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for who you are, God, that you just love us so much, God, and that you pursue after us with your never-ending love, God, that just this amazing grace that you extend towards us, God. So, Lord, I just pray as uh, we just spent this time just re receiving that message, God, as we prepare for the word today, God, I pray that you can just soften our hearts, Lord, and uh, put any guilt and shame aside and uh, follow after you. It's in Jesus' holy name that we all pray. And everyone said right there in their homes, amen. Come on, give God some praise today. Well, most of us, we know how to trash talk. And it starts really young. Three boys were bragging about their dads. The first boy says, my dad, he scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a poem. They give him $250. The second boy says, that's weak. My dad, he scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a song. They give him $500. The third boy says, that's nothing. I got both of you beat. My dad, he scribbles words on a piece of paper. He calls it a sermon. It takes six people to collect all that money. All right, that's trash talking. Today, we start a brand new series. It's four parts and it's called, Can We Talk? Right now, we've taken trash talking to a whole new level. So it seems like we can't even talk to some people. The subtitle is The Separation of Church and Hate. The church is to be distinctive. Hate is not a part of who we are. And yet some people are really nervous about this series. Others of you, you're fired up. Uh, some are thinking, this is so polarized right now. David, let's not rock the boat any more than it already is. Others are you thinking, finally, David, because you need to tell those blank and you fill in the blank. You need to tell those Republicans, those Democrats, the straight, the gay, the white, the black, whoever, David, you just need to set them straight. Now, some of you, you're just thinking, David's really in trouble now. Hey, we're living, as most of you know, in a very polarized world. The political climate is so volatile right now. Some people only see things through a filter of red or blue. The workplace is volatile. What can we say and not say? Are we going to be in person or remote? The racial tension, it's real. We've had 90 plus days of protests and counter protests in Portland. Many have led to violence and crimes. Other cities now face similar situations. Socially, are you a masker or an anti-masker? Do you care about people or you want to kill them with your COVID germs? All right, or what about personal freedom? And even in the church, it's becoming more and more polarized. How dare you open and worship, even outdoors? You mean you're going to let the government crush our religious freedom? Oh, it's just a challenging world right now. And if you don't agree with me in my position, whatever that position is, then you are evil. You see, we now live in this cancel culture. When I first started preaching at Northwest Christian Church, our vision is to have a multi-generation, multicultural church. I love to see older adults sitting next to young adults and teenagers. I love learning from young people and love when young people are mentored by older adults. It's great when those who are affluent are sitting next to the not so affluent. We obviously want ethnic diversity. I believe also in political diversity. I'm with Billy Graham. He would say, I'm not for the left wing or the right wing. I'm for the whole bird. All of us, Yankee fans, even Boston Red Sox fans, we're all created by God Almighty, worshiping together. Well, it's not always been easy. We've had confrontations, some name calling, some get mad, leave the church. They're going to go to church that will stand for the truth. Some question our or my salvation because of our belief that we're all one in Christ. I really believe Paul in his letter to the Galatians. In chapter 3, he says in verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all, all one in Christ Jesus. I believe that our faith in Jesus, that my faith filter trumps all other filters. Now, immediately, some of you were triggered one way or another by the use of the adjective trump. We're that polarized. But here's the question. 
Can you put your faith filter ahead of your political filter, your age filter, your whatever, you fill in the blank filter? And maybe it's not can you, but maybe the question is will you? Are you willing to? I believe that we need to understand this truth about each other inside the church and also outside the church as well. That we are all, all created in the image of God. Now someone should be saying amen here. All right? You should be giving me a thumbs up, something. But when you and I, when you and I interpret the words of Jesus through our filter, again, whatever filter that might be, it's amazing how often we find Jesus agrees with us. So one of my chief objectives in this series is to change the way that you and I respond to one another. Uh, how we talk to each other. Again, not just to each other inside the church, but how we talk to each other outside the church as well. I'm not trying to say that we all have to agree, but can we learn to disagree without being disagreeable? Disagreement is inevitable. It's okay. In fact, I think it's healthy. I believe that we should be able to have spirited conversations about the most important matters in life and some inane matters of life as well while not attacking people in the process. We should be able to talk with each other. We should disagree with positions, challenge presuppositions, examine logic, represent a different set of values, but still see that people, we see them exactly the way God sees them. This person is an image bearer of God. This person is someone that God loves, someone that God was willing to send his son to die on the cross for. And we want to destroy them? Wow. I, I'm saying we want to make sure that we convey Jesus. Not hate, not bias, not prejudice, just Jesus. So the next four weeks, we're going to talk about four responses. Civility, dignity, humility, and unity. Today, it's civility. U.S. News and World Report, their cover story is titled this, The American Uncivil War. Its subtitle, How Crude, Rude, and Obnoxious Behavior Has Replaced Good Manners and Why It Hurts Our Politics and Culture. The article says that 9 out of 10 Americans think incivility is a serious problem. 78% say the problem has worsened in the last 10 years. Concern, the article says, goes beyond rudeness. Respondents see incivility as evidence of a profound social breakdown. In the article, Martin Marty, a philosopher of religion, says this, the alternative to civility is first incivility and then war. But here's the kicker. This article is written nearly 25 years ago. 25 years ago, that we're saying that. Think what they would say today. I think all of us probably agree that we have lost the art of civility. I mean, in the past, there were times that you could respectfully disagree with someone. Now there is so much anger, so much vitriol in our conversations that instead of criticizing content, we now attack character. Instead of saying, I disagree with you, I, I now say, you're an idiot because you disagree with me. And when we criticize content, we're arguing about ideas and concepts, philosophical approaches. But when we move to attacking character, now we judge people. We judge their character, their personhood, their very being. And typically, well, it's just not very civil. Well, here comes a guy by the name of James. He's in the Bible. He's the brother of Jesus. His words give us some great advice, some great teaching on how a follower of Jesus should respond in conversations. So go to your Bible app, your Bible, to James chapter 1. We're going to pick it up in verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take care note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And he's going to tell us why. He says, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I like the message paraphrase. Lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue, and let anger, let anger strangle along in the rear. Well, James, he's really blunt. He's speaking to people in the church. That's who he's writing to. People who believe and want to follow Jesus. People who should already know these things. And James says, hey, take note. I want you to understand anger does not produce God's righteousness. 
So when you and I are in conflict, when we're having these intense fellowship times, that's Julia Mai's term for having an argument, or if you're having a difficult conversation, oftentimes what happens is our minds start shutting down. Our ears stop listening. And this leads to our hearts getting hard. And can we all just agree that this is not good? James says, if you and I are going to produce the righteousness that God desires, and he does desire it, James says, then you want to be able to talk. You want to be able to separate yourselves from hate. So here are three actions he tells us to take. Number one, everyone, all of us, should be quick to listen. It's been said that God gave us two ears and one mouth. So we should listen twice as much as we talk. That's good advice, but it's not always easy to apply. In some ways, again, it seems right now that we have completely forgotten how to listen to one another. In fact, most of us, we're quick to speak and we're slow to listen. And James says, this is backwards. Be quick to listen. Interesting enough, this is exactly what we want other people to do for us. I want you to listen to me, hear me. And yet the problem is we're so busy thinking about how we respond to them that we fail to listen. So we both want the very same thing. We want exactly what the person that we're having a conflict with wants. We both want to be heard and we want to be understood. I want you to be quick to listen and slow to speak. You want me to be quick to listen and slow to speak. I don't want you to argue with me. I want you to hear me. And we might even rationalize it. I can't really hear you until I feel like you have heard me. And the truth is, you can't really hear me until you feel like I have heard you. I often think that it would be very helpful for us to learn to listen to people who don't experience the world the way that we do. One of the things that I enjoy about short-term mission trips is going into the homes of the nationals and hearing their story. I'm always amazed about some part of their story. They will often share about things that I've never ever had to experience or to deal with. Sometimes it's heartbreaking because I can't even fathom what they have to deal with every single day. But you know what I discovered over the years? I've discovered that I don't have to go on a short-term mission trip to find people who have different experiences than I do, who deal with things that I've never ever had to deal with. And it's important that I listen to people and their stories, people who don't experience the world the way that I do. It's good for me to listen to their story. It's good to listen and understand their experiences. Listen to why they believe what they believe. It's good to listen to people who are different than you and different than me. Unfortunately, we're all too often quick to speak and to tell them our mind. And so that's why James comes along and he's kind of countercultural. He says, I want you to be quick to listen. Secondly, be slow to speak. Literally, we're talking about being late. When was the last time you've been told that it's okay to be late? Well, when it comes to our words, be late to speak. Because if we're slow to speak, typically our emotions are better controlled. Our words will be better chosen. And let me add this. If you have to say something, maybe start by asking a question. And the reason for this is because the minute I start speaking, I stop listening. And I would add, I stop learning. Now this next point sounds so obvious that you might miss it, or at least, at the very least, dismiss it. But everybody's behavior makes perfect sense to them. Your behavior makes perfect sense to you. The way that you react makes perfect sense to you. Uh, again, everybody's behavior makes perfect sense to them. Everybody's response makes perfect sense to them. Everybody's viewpoint makes perfect sense to them. Everybody's politics makes perfect sense to them. So when we don't understand it, it's because we don't understand. I mean, have you ever heard yourself saying or thinking, I have no idea why they would do that, why they think that. I don't know why they would believe that. I have no clue why they would say that. If this has ever been you, you just made a confession. There's something you don't understand. So guess what? It's time to listen. Why? So that you can understand. 
So learn to have conversations with some people that are just not like you. Now, there's a problem with social media. And yes, I'm saying social media has its problem. In fact, maybe lots of problems. But one of the problems is with their algorithms. When you click on a news article on Facebook, it's now going to start feeding you more and more stories like that one. And the more you read those stories, the narrower it focuses the thinking in you. It's designed to reinforce what you already believe. In marriage counseling, they often teach you to repeat what the other person said. It's called active listening. Well, this helps you hear what the other person said or didn't say. I heard you say these jeans, these jeans make me look fat. <laughs> no, that's not what I said at all. How'd you get that? So again, that's why we repeat. That's why we want to be active in our listening. So again, seek to understand. Become a student, not a critic. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. And here's number three, slow to become angry. Is there any doubt that we need this, especially today? Slow to become angry is going to be both a result and a decision. If you and I are quick to listen and slow to speak, we're less likely to be angry. And it will be easier to guard against our anger. And most of us know our anger gets us into trouble. Anger does some strange things to us. This guy, he's known as who? The Hulk. But really, he's what? A scientist. He's Dr. David Banner. That's most of the time. And most of the time, he's a nice guy. But then there are times when he becomes angry. And he will say things like this. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And if the person ignores his warning, before your very eyes, he transforms into this big green monster, the incredible Hulk. Anger. Anger simply turns a normal person oftentimes into a monster. Anger can turn you into someone that you just don't want to be. And that's why I like James and his advice. He says the longer that you and I listen, the more that you and I learn, hey, the less angry we will typically be. And what's great about James is he gives us some reasons why we should be this way. Look at verse 20. It's because, again, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, I've said it before, but again, not all anger is bad. The Bible, in fact, speaks of God getting angry. There were some things that made Jesus angry, righteous anger. God gave us the ability to get angry. Sometimes anger is the appropriate response. Sometimes anger is the evidence of love. Someone hurts my wife or hurt my kids, I get angry. And if I didn't, you would wonder, well, what's the matter with David? So anger is a legitimate emotion until, until we lose control and start getting angry turning green. Now, none of us have to be taught on how to become angry. Juliana Joe, she's the sweetest baby girl in the world, all right, my granddaughter. But take away her bottle from the sweet little girl, you will see anger. You'll see a red face, sounds that penetrate walls and pierce ears. I'm telling you, anyone can be angry. All of us have the capacity of becoming angry. So we need to talk about how to handle our anger so we can slow it down. Typically, three agendas play out in our life. There's your agenda, there's their agenda, and of course, God's agenda. My anger typically produces only what I desire. I know that I'm right, and I want you to know that I'm right. And when your anger produces only what you desire, well, this goes against what God desires. Look at verse 21. Therefore, James writes, get rid of all, all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, so prevalent. And then he says, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Moral filth here, it actually can mean dishonor. This becomes a moral issue. Often you and I, we get so angry over what we see as moral issues that we then oftentimes cross the moral lines in the way that we talk to one another. Evil here can be translated as malice. Malice is the desire that we have to get even. Malice is the desire to pay back. James says, get rid of all of that. And then he uses the word humbly. I'm going to talk about that in a couple of weeks, very specifically. But let me just say this. When James says humbly accept, this does not mean that you and I, that we give up our convictions. It does mean, though, that we hold them with humility. 
I'm not going to hold them like a baseball bat. I'm not going to beat people up over with my convictions. Humility says we is more important than me. And then James uses the phrase, the word planted in you. In other words, you and I are Christ followers. We're followers of Jesus. This is where our greatest loyalty needs to reside. So always, always remember who you belong to. Okay, this is the backdrop. So now let me again ask this question. Are you willing to put your faith filter ahead of your political filter, your age filter, your, again, whatever you want to fill in that blank filter? You see, oftentimes many people, they've created a version of their faith that supports their filter. It supports their politics, their age stage, their you name it. And that's why issues often become so emotional for us. But again, this series is not intended to get you to change some of your political views or your age views or other views, which I know disappoints some of you. This series is intended to change the way that you and I respond to one another, the way that you and I respond to others who have different viewpoints than we do. Followers of Jesus, we have to respond with civility. We can disagree, but we're going to do so respectfully. So when you win an argument, you don't really win anything. I'm a very competitive person. I want to win at almost everything. <laughs> Actually, check that. I want to win at everything. And sometimes I've made it a competition to win. And what I've learned over the years is that my winning actually has cost me. You may win, but in the process, burn a bridge to a relationship. Why? Because you have to be right. It's been put this way. You want to be right at each other? God wants us to be right with each other. So look for yourself, though. But almost every conversion story in the Bible will begin with some kind of civil conversation. In other words, there's a dialogue. Paul, in the book of Acts, he didn't show up in Athens and say, you people are so stupid. How can you have so many false gods? It's so unbelievable that you even have run out of names for them. That's not what he does. And said, you know what Paul says? I can see you're very religious people. In fact, you even have an altar to an unknown God. And then he makes this pivot. Let me tell you, he says, about the unknown God. Brilliant, brilliant. You and I, we have to get better at engaging in civil conversations. And again, let me just say this, that we're not gonna reach the world for Jesus through obnoxious Facebook posts. I'm just saying Here's the biggest thing that we have to do, and that is think. Think before we speak. We're always supposed to think before we engage our mouth. There's an acrostic that will help us remember it, and it's using that word think. And then each letter has a word for it. Number one is what am I about to say? Is it truthful? You see, the tendency for each of us is we want to use hyperbole to make our point. The Dallas Cowboys are the greatest football team of all time. Well, of course, that's true. No, that's hyperbole, right? Or all Democrats are, you fill in the blank. Republicans, they don't care about, you fill in the blank. No. Think, is what I'm about to say truthful? Is it the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Or is it twisted a little bit? Is it an attitude that makes you look better? H, is it helpful? Remember, just because something is true does not mean that it is helpful. Gossip actually might be true, but it's not helpful. So what is my purpose for speaking these next words that I'm about to speak? Is my purpose to win the argument? To prove that you are wrong? At what price? Again, Paul says the only thing coming out of our mouth should be words that are helpful for building others up, for encouraging others. So is what I'm about to say helpful? I, is it inspirational? Is it gonna build up or again, is it gonna tear down? Is it gonna give people hope? Is it gonna encourage them? Is it going to make them want to move forward in their life? It should do that. Your words should do that. In, is it necessary? This is that thing of talking too much. Some things are just not necessarily wrong to say. They're just not necessary to say. Here's K. Is it kind? Proverbs 12 says, Worry can rob you of happiness, but kind words, they will cheer you up. Kind words are incredibly powerful. I like what author Frederick Buechner says, although kindness is not the same thing as holiness, 
It's awfully close. So this week, if you really want to live on the edge, I want you to look for an opportunity to dialogue with someone, someone who you disagree with politically. Not on Facebook, not on social media, all right? And maybe some of you are saying, well, David, I don't even know anybody that I disagree with politically. Hey, that's a problem. School's about to start, all right? This is a good reminder for you and for me that we need to become students, not critics. Otherwise, you and I will discount every piece of information that doesn't fit into our maybe even potentially flawed worldview. But most of all, live on the edge this week by doing this. Think before you speak. And again, how? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Lead with your ears. Follow up with your tongue. Let anger, let it straggle along in the rear. Let me pray. Father, again, I know this is a hot topic right now and all that's going on in our world and how some of us can't talk with each other without getting angry or calling people names. And we're so disgusted or so frustrated or some of us are so disappointed about what we see around us and yet, God, we're part of it. And so, God, for the church, for those of us who are following Jesus, help us to be able to monitor the way that we're speaking. Help us to be part of the solution. Help us to learn what it means to dialogue even with people who disagree with us and to do it with civility. And God, thank you most of all for your son Jesus who was that bridge between us and you. Help us to be the bridge between someone else and you as well. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Our subject today is civility. It's about treating one another with respect, honoring one another without prejudice or special treatment for some, but disdain or disrespect for others. For certain, there's one place we must act with civility. It's in church, at communion. Here are our orders from 1 Corinthians 11, 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. Specifically, that means we're to take note of how we treat other people. In that Corinthian church, the rich were shown all kinds of favors, sitting in the best places with the best people, maybe going ahead and eating their good food. They ignored or looked down on the poor among them. Not good, the scripture says. Mm -hmm. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That's why we examine ourselves. Everybody is welcome here. Nobody is better than anybody else, nor less worthy than anybody else. Christ died for all. We can't treat anyone with less civility than Christ did. God, we take this bread and we drink from this cup to remember and honor you and all those you gave your only son to die for. Help us always to be civil. In the name of Christ, amen. So we take the bread and we drink of the cup in the name of Jesus. So we just spend some time reflecting on Jesus' sacrifice and responding to that message. I just want to encourage you today that, just like the song talks about, that God is a restorer. He is the light. So maybe you're in a broken relationship. you got to know that he's going to restore it. Come on, let's sing this together. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out. 
life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great. next part of this song. Church, can this be our prayer today that no matter if people think different than us, we have different opinions, we can still be united in love and be our prayer that all the earth will shout praises to Jesus, that we'll be united in his love. Can we proclaim and believe that today as we sing this? Come on, let's sing all the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great Again, thanks for uh, joining us in worship today. I, I know that uh, some of this is a real challenge for us, but we have a great God. And that God is going to help us every step of the way. And again, I'm just asking you this week to be really intentional about how you see what your speaking is about, what your response is, how you respond to each other, to those in your family, those in the church, those who are outside the church, those who disagree with you, those who agree with you. Let's really be intentional this week about serving God, our great God, by being attentive to the way that we speak. And let's do that with civility. 
And again, if you have any questions or if you need some help on that, we'd love to be able to do that. Make sure that you're taking a look in our program. Lots of things going on that we're really excited about. I'll also let you know that if you have any other questions, our online host will be able to help you as well. Thanks again. We'll see you next week.